No, thank you very much. It's truly an honor to be here uh, representing class one. I'm a little amused that I'm picked to, uh, with the type of material that can be easily presented to a general audience. <laughs> I'm a mathematician. I'm a pure mathematician uh, on the abstract side of pure mathematics. And so when I was asked to send a photo of me in action doing my <laughs> research, I thought, you know, I could see the captions, Kra lies on the couch. You know, Kra stares out the window. You know, they, these really were not action shots, and it was really difficult for me to uh, figure out how to explain what I do. Um, my time, what do I do? I spend my time proving theorems. Okay, so more accurately, I probably spend my time trying to prove theorems because that's how mathematicians spend most of their time. Uh, and even much of what I do, much of my research, is not clear what the applications will be, if there ever will be applications that emerge. And even if they do emerge, it might be a century from now for the things that I think about. But I want to make you know, the, a case for the support of the unabashed pursuit of research, um, fundamental research, because it continues to play a decisive role, especially research in mathematics, in all of the science developments that are represented here at the National Academies. So an example is mathematics from over 50 years ago that was in abstract number theory is the underpinnings of every time you go and make an on online transaction that we just take for granted. Um, this is, you know, there was no way to predict that that's what would be going on with that basic research in number theory. So my goal today is to try and tell you actually a theorem, and it's a theorem that has been proved in the last year. So, um, but like all mathematics, it's going to be built on many, many years of research. Um, and I just want to give you a reminiscence, though, of what it's like to sit and do research. I, I think every mathematician can really name the first time that they had a true insight, a mathematical insight. And I don't mean an insight that's culled from reading a paper or culled from books but one where you see something new that you really understand, that you think, ah, nobody else saw this before. And my such insight was in a particularly beautiful place. I was sitting on a rooftop of a house in the Alpujarra Mountains in Spain, and I was supposed to be on a hiking trip, and I'd injured my knee. So I spent the time working, as I said, working, you know, sitting there, staring at the sunsets. And as the sun set, I actually saw this theorem in my head. I could see all the pieces how it fit together. I knew that the logical flow of one step to the next, it was suddenly extremely clear to me what I needed to do to prove the result that I'd been thinking about for quite a long time. And um, you know, these disjoint ideas, they all fit together. And it was this phenomenal moment for me. Of course, you know, from that to writing up the paper was another several years, which it's like that in math. And then to publication was even another few years. Um, but let me try to, to tell you about a little bit about what type of research I do. So as was mentioned, I work in dynamical systems. Dynamical systems is, well, many of you do dynamical systems in one way or another. It's the study of systems and how they evolve with time. So perhaps the best known example that's usually give is the planets rotating around the sun. Well, that dynamical system is very concrete, and the ones I do are very abstract, where there's no planets and there's no sun and there's there's just some rule that I'm looking at and following, and I want to make predictions about sort of the average behavior um, that happens. So the specific areas are Gothic theory that I work in. And I, the one thing I want you to take away from that is that the common theme in all of these things is these systems change. They continually to change with time. They evolve with time. So it came as a bit of a surprise to me that once I decided I was studying dynamical systems when I was a grad student, that there was a way to connect these systems um, to, to something to study static problems. Okay, so problems that really don't seem to be related to motion and changes in time, but problems that seem to be in an unrelated field. Okay, so let me give you a little bit of context. Here's a picture. You know, we don't do amazing pictures like some of the biology ones coming. <laughs> right? These are the integers. Okay, it's a nice picture. And the integers, well, the first hundred integers, the integers have lots of patterns inside them. So what's a pattern in what I'm going to think about? Let's think about if you start at the number, I guess 24 is what I'm starting with here, and add 10 each time. Okay? 
this is an arithmetic progression. The arithmetic progression here has length three. And just the important point is you start somewhere and you add some constant amount each time. So for example, I could start at 56 and add 11 to it, and there I would get an arithmetic progression of length four. So these are patterns. There's lots of other patterns you can think of. You could think of, you know, are there two numbers, A plus B equals C, or two numbers that differ by a square. Obviously, all those patterns are in the integers. So, so far, this is not a very interesting or deep thing to think about. But let's say I look at the integers, and pretend these are all the integers, right? It goes on to infinity. But I color them. I color them either red or blue, every integer. I randomly assign a color to each one of them. Now you could ask, are there still patterns, but where I insist that these patterns are only in one of the colors? OK? Not? So you could say, OK, can I insist that there's always a pattern in blue? Then if the pattern I'm going to focus on today is arithmetic progressions. Well, your response to me should be immediately, that's a really silly thing to do. What if you colored them all red? OK, so it's a bad question. So we change the question and say, OK, what if I insist that the pattern is either blue or red? You don't have to tell me which one, but there should be a pattern that's monochromatic. So for example, in here, there's a, I guess it's a red arithmetic progression, starts at 14, and you add one each time. OK, it's length three. There are other arithmetic progressions in there. I'm sure you can find many more. I highlighted one in green here. You start at 58, and you add 10 each time, an arithmetic progression of the length four. So this wouldn't be very easy, you know, interesting, if I keep just looking for specific ones. But there is a general theorem, and this was proved back in the 1920s. I told you math builds on old results, so I'll go back to there as inspiration for what I want to talk about. And the formal statement is that if you give me any coloring of the integers, and the word finite is important, you're only allowed to use finitely many colors, or you could assign each one of them a different color. But you give me any coloring of the integers using finitely many colors, then it has arbitrarily long monochromatic arithmetic progressions. Okay. Now, this is, this, was, this is one of the, quote, pearls of number theory. There's a little book which names this as uh, Kinshein wrote this. And it's almost a century old, and it continues to have deep influence. But the question is, what's really behind these patterns? Is it really that I used finitely many colors? And it's not. It turns out there's something much deeper. So here I managed to fit 450, but again, I imagine they go all the way up to infinity. And I've highlighted in blue about 10% of the numbers. Okay? And you could ask now, is this 10% that I'm looking at enough to find arithmetic progressions? Okay? And you might be able to find one. In fact, I didn't actually look, but it, it, there probably are some arithmetic progressions there um, in, in blue. And you could find other patterns, for example, two numbers that differ by a square, or two numbers or three numbers, such that you jump from each time by a square. And in fact, this was a deep conjecture that was made by Erdos and Turan. Erdos made many conjectures, including the one I'll get to in about five minutes. And uh, what, what this theorem that Simoretti proved uh, in a deep breakthrough after much partial progress was that if you just take a set of integers the technical is positive upper density, but for all intents and purposes, you can just think about this as a positive percentage of the integers. Okay, there's big intervals on which you see a positive percentage. Well, if you look at this set of integers, then with positive upper density, it actually already contains arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And you might wonder, why did I say this is a deep generalization of van der Verden's theorem? Well, if you use only finitely many colors, one of those colors appears with positive upper density. So this implies van der Verden. And there have been lots of generalizations of this uh, to, to finding other patterns. But this looks like a really static theorem. I hope you'll agree with me. You give me a set, you find something in it. Okay, so here's my set. I'm looking at it. But where's the dynamics? Well, look at the, look at the blue ones. They're shifting over one at a time, okay, moving over each time. Okay, if you follow them, they're moving over. This is actually a dynamical system there where the rule is subtract one from every integer. So the blue ones are moving over, and you can see there's another blue one at the bottom creeping in. 450 became blue as I shifted over. And what's important about this shifting is that at each step, if the original set had positive upper density, if it was big in this way, the shifts are all big in this way. 
And now you've turned this into a dynamical system. And the dynamical system, I mean, I'm cheating a little bit. It's not quite exactly this system. But there's a way to make it into a system so that we can bring to bear on it all the tools of ergodic theory and of dynamics. Because what we do is by shifting, we have many different objects to look at. And we can average them. And there's a deep insight, and this was the insight of Furstenberg, who said, well, you can average them and look for patterns in the averaging where now you have statistical information to use on these. And if you find a pattern on average, there must have been one somewhere originally. So this turns this very static-looking problem into a dynamical one where we can use ergodic theory and many, many other tools. So when Furstenberg proved this theorem in the 70s, it was a big breakthrough. Um, and I heard lectures on it. These were the lectures I heard when I was a grad student, was him lecturing on this proof. OK, it was not in the 70s. I'm a little younger than that. But um, So I heard him lecturing on this. And it was just, to me, it was the most amazing connection between dynamics, a very motion, and static questions here, a very um, uh, non-moving question. And I spent much of my career working on those averages and understanding what controls those averages. And so what does it mean to control those averages? It means that there's something, some object, a dynamical object in the system that you construct that tells you when these averages converge, when they converge, what they converge to, and what that information can give you about the system and what it means combinatorially, so going back to information about the integers. Now, Furstenberg's method had then been used by many other researchers, um, um, by myself and many others, to generalize and not just find arithmetic progressions, which is one particular type of pattern, but to find things that are called polynomial progressions, things that differ by the squares, to find things that are uh, progression and arithmetic progression where the differences are restricted. They can be the primes minus one, you know, not, not the primes for some um, parity reasons, but the primes shifted by one can be these differences, and so on. But it left open a big question, which is what about infinite patterns? All of the patterns I've told you about so far have been things like an arithmetic progression of length four. That's finite. Or something shifted primes, finitely many. How many can I find in there, and so on. So what if you ask now, let me find an infinite pattern inside, again, the set of positive upper density, these blue ones, take 10% of the integers. Is there any infinite pattern? And you can think about this for a while and say, well, you can't have an infinite arithmetic progression. There are reasons that, that you can get rid of that. But what kinds of patterns can you have? And Erdos, who I mentioned earlier, had lots of conjectures about this, like what kinds of infinite patterns can you have in there? And he asked a question, um, can you find inside a set of positive upper density, things that look like sums. So let me state precisely, and this is the theorem that's um, just jointly with my collaborators, uh, Joel Moreira, Florian Richter, and Donald Robertson. And this is a theorem from, well, 2022, um, which says the following. You take a set of integers with positive upper density. So again, think of it as 10% maybe, but it could be 0.1%. It doesn't matter that there are infinite sets of integers, b1, b2, up to bk, such that when you start summing and you pick one b1 from b1 and b2 from b2 and bk from bk, and you take all of those sums, that all of these sums are contained in my original set. Okay? And that's an infinite bunch of sums that are in there. For k equals 2, for just two sums, this was previously proven by Morera, Richter, and Robertson in a really beautiful paper. But we needed new methods to approach higher k, for k bigger than or equal to 3. And it turns out it's exactly the same dynamical objects that are controlling the averages that come up in the Furstenberg's theorem that I mentioned earlier. So these same objects that I'd worked on for much of my life came back uh, to, to be of use in this, in this theorem. And this opens up many new questions. This is really the first example of infinite patterns that come in these sets. And the question is, what other ones? Are there polynomial patterns? Are there shifted prime patterns? And many such other things for which I hope we can use the statistical behavior to understand. 
So let me just conclude with saying that I would not be standing here without my amazing collaborators, my amazing colleagues at Northwestern and other institutions, my amazing friends and, and who have supported me throughout, and my incredible family who've let me get to this place. Thank you.